So our project on the materials and techniques of JEH McDonald started in the spring of 2013 and it's now almost complete. It's a collaborative project between the McMichael Canadian Art Collection and the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa where I work as a conservation scientist. Uh, there are 32 paintings in the project and they're from three different institutions, the McMichael, the National Gallery of Canada and the Art Gallery of Ontario. And um, my colleague Alison Douglas, who's the conservator at the McMichael, can tell you more about the choice of the paintings and the different periods in McDonald's career, as well as how the project really got started. Um, well, the, the project really got started uh, because we really felt it was long overdue to do significant research on the co-founder, one of the co-founders of the Group of Seven, and a very a distinguished Canadian artist. Um, but also because we do have a number of exhibitions upcoming at the McMichael celebrating the 100th anniversary of the group. Um, and in terms of once we were all on board with the project, uh, I worked with our chief curator in order to categorize um, his body of work into periods. Um, this has been basically done geographically. So we have early period, um, then Algoma, Nova Scotia, uh, British Columbia, and Georgian Bay, and then Barbados. And in terms of uh, choosing the, the particular works for the study, it was really looking across um, the collections of the three institutions you mentioned and, and picking significant representative works uh, with a variety of materials. And the goal of the project is to de develop a database of McDonald's materials and techniques, which can be useful for several different reasons, including for conservators to help develop conservation treatments that are appropriate and determine storage and display conditions. And also more on the curatorial side, when there are questions of attribution, if there's an unknown painting, we can look at the materials in that work and then compare it to the materials in our database to see if they're consistent with what McDonald used during a certain period. So for my part of the study, I examined all 32 works visually where we can identify supports and see the different layers of the work. Uh, under magnification, where you can see brush strokes and technique. Um, and under ultraviolet illumination, um, we can identify various coatings used to produce the work. Um, in this particular piece, Algoma Hills from 1920, uh, when we look at it visually, we are first struck by this very thin board that the work is executed on. This dense laminated board is thought to be uh, a millboard from the bookbinding industry. Also, when we look under magnification, we um, can identify um, some of his working methods. So, McDonald used an underdrawing or underpainting with very thin, translucent oil paints before he began his final composition. When we examine this work under ultraviolet illumination, we are struck by this bright orange fluorescence. And this is the signature fluorescence of shellac. J.H. McDonald, in this period, the Algoma period, coated his supports front and back with shellac first before he painted. For chemical analysis of the paint, a number of tiny samples of all the different colors were taken from each painting. These are extremely small samples. In fact, they're barely visible to the naked eye. We do all our sampling through a microscope using surgical tools like scalpels, tweezers, etc. And it's very important that our tools, as well as the glass slide where we place the sample, are clean and dust free. To show how McDonald applied his preparation layers in his paint, some of our samples were taken as tiny cross sections. These are core samples that contain all the layers from the support the preparation, the paint layers, and a varnish if there is one. We mount the cross section in polyester resin and we polish it to expose the layer structure. Then we look at our cross sections through a microscope using both visible light and with UV fluorescence. Sometimes it takes up to five different techniques to be able to thoroughly characterize a paint in terms of the pigments, the binding media, and the fillers that might be present. Um, all of our instruments are optimized for the analysis of very tiny amounts of sample. So most of them are interfaced to a microscope and they all have very sensitive detectors. One of the key instruments we used for the analysis of the paint is a scanning electron microscope with energy dispersive spectrometry. 
This instrument allows us to look at the sample in very high magnification with an electron beam, and at the same time, we can determine the chemical elements that are present in the paint. It's important to note this doesn't actually tell us what pigment is present, just what element is present. So for example, if we see lead in a paint sample, that could correspond to the pigment lead white, but it could also correspond to another lead-containing compound like lead sulfate. To determine the nature of the compounds and the exact pigments that are present, we used a combination of different techniques, including X-ray diffraction, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, and polarized light microscopy. The Fourier transform infrared spectrometer is one of our most versatile instruments, and in fact, we analyzed all the paint samples using this method. To prepare the sample, we put it on a very tiny diamond to flatten it prior to analysis. And then we take the diamond holder and put it on the stage of the infrared microscope. This technique is based on the fact that um, molecules absorb infrared radiation at different wavelengths depending on their chemical bonds. And so the overall infrared spectrum is a combination of all the absorptions of the different materials that are present, so the pigments, binding media, etc. The spectra can give a lot of information, but they're sometimes quite complicated to interpret. A polarizing light microscope is very helpful to visualize the paint mixtures that McDonald used. We can also identify a number of the pigments using this technique by observing the size, shape, color of the pigment particles, as well as the way they interact with polarized light. Some of the interesting things I observed while examining these 32 paintings for the study with McDonald's oil sketches, his early period supports are quite varied. Whereas his Algoma period supports, he favored a very thin millboard support. In terms of oil sketch preparation, uh, in the early period, again, we see a varied use of ground and colored ground, whereas uh, in the Algoma period and beyond, we, we see the use of shellac with an underdrawing and then the final composition um, executed over top of that. In terms of his works on canvas, he used both linen and jute. Jute is interesting as it degrades very quickly and weakens over time. In terms of technique, early period works had paint that was applied wet on wet, more thickly, with muddier tones, whereas later works were produced with directional, juxtaposed, bright colors. Although there were some changes in the materials that McDonald used over his career, there were definitely certain pigments and pigment mixtures that he um, preferred. Uh, for example, all the purple colors that we see on his paintings are red-blue mixtures, very often a mixture of ultramarine blue and alizarin red and his favored green pigment was viridian. It's almost the only green pigment that he used, in fact. Sometimes his green colors might be mixtures of viridian with other pigments, but generally they're based on that um, hydrated chromium oxide pigment. McDonald rarely used pure blacks on his works. Colors that appear to be black on his paintings are generally either very, very dark purples or dark blues. Like other members of the Group of Seven, as well as Tom Thompson, McDonald preferred a white pigment composed of a mixture of lead sulfate and zinc oxide. This was a very characteristic white paint, and our research has shown that it came from the Cambridge Colors Artist brand, which was made by British colorman Matterton and Company. This paint uh, was available in Toronto as early as 1906, and was still available in 1932, which is the year of McDonald's death. We determined through the analysis that this was his preferred white pigment during all periods of his career. So at this point, I've completed all the analysis of all our tiny paint samples from the 32 works and put them all into the database. And Allison has completed all her visual examinations and writing up all her observations. And so now I think the fun part starts. Yeah, this is where the fun begins and we get to compare notes and look for trends. And so I'm really looking forward to our ongoing collaboration. I've had an amazing experience working with CCI on this project. And so there will be more to come.